All right, let's get down to business. This is an interesting time to be alive. This is an interesting time to be a part of Jesus' church. And I pray today you have an encounter with God for yourself and that you hear words spoken over yourself. I uh, am speaking to each and every single person under my voice today. Even those of you in Redemption Church, I believe you're going to have an encounter with God in that building today for yourself and you're going to leave changed. And I want to show you what God's plan is for your life and what He's calling you into. Because the days of being reliant on your pastor as your God, as your leader, is not anymore. And I'll tell you why, because the church is not looking for a a powerful pastor. They are looking for a powerful people. They are looking for people whose lives are changed in front of their eyes. And so often people will sit in church and see someone minister the word of God and it is powerful and it is scriptural. But coming and sitting and attending and leaving is not Christianity. It is not a passive faith. It is a faith of partnership. It is a faith where God shows you He is with you. He chose you. He called you. And this takes something supernatural because it's easy to sit there and think that person is so impressive. That person on the stage knows the Bible all the way from beginning to end, which most don't. That person has their life perfectly in order, which most aren't. That person lives a life without mistakes and failures and shortcomings and fears. That's a lie. But we think that Christianity is about getting under an impressive pastor. And yes, that is true. But that is not what is scripturally accurate for you as the church. And I am all for leaders being used by God. But can I tell you something? We would not know what to do with our buildings, buildings in general, if the church was the church. If the church was the church, we wouldn't be able to cope. If the church was the church, we wouldn't be worrying about about the politics of life, the politics of church leadership. We'd be going, "Uh, um, who who got saved last week? Me, can you preach what you heard last week that got you saved? Yes, okay, you're over there telling those people what you heard last week. Because when God anointed and appointed and released the church, I wanna take you into that moment so that you can see It's not what you thought it was. Because you're sitting there right now and whether you've been in church 20 years or this is your first Sunday, maybe it is your first Sunday, maybe you're sitting here today and you're going, I shouldn't have showed up at this church service. This pastor's talking about being a Christian. I'm not even a Christian yet. Well, I'm gonna show you from scripture, this is what took place. Constantly, consistently. In fact, it was just a scramble for what do we do and how do we cope with this? And the interesting thing is the Bible tells us that the world waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed. Now, can I tell you this? On the earth right now, we are having wars, rumors of wars. We are having innocent blood being shed everywhere. We are having uh, the innocent starving and going hungry. I saw on the news, it is Child Protection Week. And I thought that was incredibly ironic because I don't believe society does much to protect children, especially the unborn. I feel that we as the church should be the ones saying to pregnant girls who don't know what to do, maybe they're even 13, 12, we will walk with you. We will support you. We will help raise this child with you. It's not about judging the action, but being a part of the solution. Yet we are silent because it is politically incorrect. It is whatever that word is, incorrect. Uh, Because the church, let me just say this, the church does not exist to appease the world's thinking. Because the world's thinking is not from God's word. 
And the more we bow, the more they will stand. The more they will say beg. Now, I don't intend in any way, shape or form to get political. But what I can tell you is there is power and there is purpose behind the church in Scripture that I think God is calling us into again. So we're going to go to the moment that has impacted the world. But I want to show it to you because when I was this week, I was in, in Europe uh, with our church family, our redemption churches, and I was on the plane and I was having an honest conversation with God. I tend to have these often. Not a, not a religious conversation with God, a, a real conversation with God. The conversation that was simply saying this, God, how on earth are we going to do this? How on earth are we going to do this? How on earth are we going to lead churches? How on earth are we going to allow people to walk in their divine callings? This is not the season. This is not the time. And on a plane to Europe, let me just say this. Europe is not a place that has Christianity as its main faith. Uh, you don't go there and say, listen to this T.D. Jake sermon. It will change your life. People say, what? What is a sermon? Who is the, what are you talking about? Right? The only way people come to faith in Christ is through the power of God functioning through someone. I'm not talking about standing in a square or a piazza or a place where people are with a loud hailer telling them if they don't repent, they will burn in hell. I'm talking about people who know your story. They know where they come from. They work with you. They live with you. Seeing your mess turn into a message and saying, what, spirit, what, what book are you reading? What, what mushroom are you eating? What pill are you taking that you have happiness in the middle of sadness? What, what antidepressant did they put you on? That's the language of the world. Which person are you sleeping with so that you're happily married on the side? What pornography are you watching that helps fulfill the void that your wife doesn't fulfill? These are the questions the world has. Right? They're not asking us to bring about the seventh revelation in Hebrew. And those things are fantastic, but what is a relevant church? What is a real God? <laughs> well, we have it in Scripture. So I arrive in Hungary, where we have Redemption Hungary, started in lockdown. I show up to the leaders' meeting. I walk along the streets. Marijuana is legal, prostitution, all these things, you know what I'm saying? You, you walk the streets of Europe, you see the real people, right? You can get high just walking the streets. <laughs> and I go into a little room, and there's a handful of people passionate about Jesus, passionate about redemption hungry. They can't speak English, I can't speak Hungarian. I have, there is no connection naturally to this. And so... I went to the bathroom before the meeting and I said, God, why am I here? I don't, I don't need a church to lead. We don't, contrary to what you may think, Taryn, I don't do this for a job. Even honestly, right now, Taryn and I feel led by God not to draw a salary at Rhema Church, but to start to sew everything back in to rebuild. But it's okay. And I'm not telling you that to bring, I'm telling you we're doing this for a calling. Because I tell you this, I don't need people hating me all over social media, telling everyone what my intentions are, what my character is like, what my plans are. I, I, I have enough issues in my life to stand on the stage and pretend to stand for a word of God that is going to run head on into the law and the culture of society of the future. I didn't sign up for this in the natural. It's not wise of me to think of my children and the persecution that may come in time to come. We may be beyond in the world the days of the church existing legally within society. <laughs> well, that's what they had to deal with. Welcome to the real faith. The one where whether the emperor says it's good or it's bad doesn't change your mind. Whether society says we agree or we don't doesn't change your mind. Where you follow your God with your faith because that's what you believe for eternity. And, and so I, we, we're not doing this. It's a huge honor, but it's also a huge responsibility. 
And I must be honest with you, given the days we've lived through in the last few years, seeing many, many leaders of the church fall, be taken out, I, it's, it's not the time to go, this is, this is all about conferences and travel, <laughs> being, being famous and being celebrated. No, we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to do what God asks of us, whether people like it or not. We, we, are, we are called and obedient to what God asks of us. And as long as we are in the position we're in, God has us there for a purpose. So I'm standing in this toilet and I'm thinking, God, what do I have to say to a handful of people in Hungary? What is this all about? The Holy Spirit dropped in me the word commission. So I thought to myself, okay, that's interesting. That's why I'm here. So I went to read the Great Commission and a confession is, I don't know all of Scripture, and I haven't studied all of Scripture. Be honest with you, I have a long way to go. And I hadn't studied the Great Commission, well, I hadn't seen what I saw there, because I don't know if you've heard of the Great Commission. You know, that moment where Jesus speaks to his followers, his disciples, and he sends them to change the world. The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Well, I want to take you to that moment because you're going to see it was only because there's a great God that it was the Great Commission. And so when I started to sense that, I then met with our church in, in the Netherlands and I started to feel that this word was carrying on and on and flowing. And we gathered in the church in the Netherlands and, and, and the Netherlands is the same. In fact, even in the Netherlands right now, they are so far down a liberal mandate that there is discussion around legalizing, well not legalizing, but accepting that pedophilia is a sexual preference. Because we're all entitled to be attracted to whomever we want and whatever we want. So now the understanding is we can't hate people for being pedophiles, we have to accept that's how they are sexually wired. But then we have to look at ways to accommodate pedophilia legally within society. This is where the world's going, everyone. But you know what's beautiful about this? The darker it gets, the more they look for the light. And so when the Bible says they eagerly await the sons and daughters of God, they're not looking for another religion. They are looking for people who are not functioning as sons and daughters of the world, but that they are beaming with light, that there is light in their life that there is a divine hand on their life, that there is a relevancy on their life. And so as we've kept doing this in church, God has moved and I believe we're going into a season where church is not going to be as predictable as we thought. Yes, we have four worship songs, we have announcements, we have an offering, we have, but, but that we come into a building expecting God to reach us, that we sit under the word expecting an encounter with God. That, that, that we come and we leave changed. That we come deeply offended, deeply broken, and we leave changed. I, I, I have to tell you this. Tara and I both feel a deep, deep responsibility to steward that the Holy Spirit and that God moves when we gather. Because you, you don't need more sermons. You, you, need to, you need to be in God's presence and just feel him and just receive from him and just go, yes. And so when we had church like this in Holland, <coughs> God did mighty things, but it wasn't for me. It was just that we facilitated that God needs to move, but it was around the subject. So what is the subject today? The subject is simply this, it's go time. It's go time. It, it, is, it is not a season of waiting. It is not a season of, of being passive. It's a season of stepping into purpose. And, and that purpose is not we're a part of a big church. It's not we're a part of the next big church. Do you want to know what our strategy at Rayman Redemption is? It's to reach the unsaved, not to convince other Christians to leave their church for our church. Because we have better facilities and nicer lights and, and cooler things. Now, those things are amazing. And, and Tara and I are trusting God to move in such a way that we can, we can even take this campus into a level that is supernaturally and a light beacon. That's what we want, right? But can God move before we do that? Can God fill this place without a famous preacher? 
Can God bring miracles where people aren't even getting to the altar yet? They're getting saved in the car park. Can he do that? Yes. Can God move in such a way that if people are watching just over a screen, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and changes their life? That they watch in a different language and yet somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, so it's go time. And that word go is very literal. <laughs> move. Okay? So I want to take you into the Great Commission. Because a commission in this language means co-mission. All right? Not getting a, a part of a government deal. Okay. It means, it means you and I are going to the same place for the same purpose. And it's called the Great Commission because it is not the purpose of people. It is the purpose of God in partnership with his people. All right? So let's go to this amazing moment where a handful of people were spoken over by the risen Christ. And the result was a move of God that changed the world forever. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16. I want to show you the natural situation so that you can see the truth, <laughs> the reality. It sounds the Great Commission, the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. First off, there was 12. Now we're starting with 11. So the first thing we recognize is, yeah, we've already lost some people along the way. There was 12. 12 is the number of leadership, covers all the nations, all the tribes. We're at 11. Don't know what the spiritual significance of 11 is. All I know is it's one less than 12, right? Right, before COVID, we had thousands. Now we have hundreds and less. That's okay. That's fine. God understands. Right, God can work with one if he has to. So 11. All right, we down one. Great news. This is the risen Christ, by the way, who appears to them, resurrected. They watched him die. And now he appears to 11 of them, risen. And the Bible tells us some worship and some doubt. I don't know about you, like the heart, that's why I was laughing. When you go to Europe and when you preach, you know, it's all fantastic, this room. But let me say, when there's a few people in a room, it's real. When you're ministering to, you can see their faces. Now, Jesus is ministering to 11 and some doubt him to the resurrected face of Christ. In other words, God wants you to know, and I'm speaking specifically to you, right? Even if you show up doubting, you can leave moving in the faith that those who were worshiping were. See, Jesus doesn't change what he's about to speak over them because they are ready in their own strength. Their questions are answered. No, no. Imagine you're the risen Christ and you say to them, here I am. And some worship and some go, yeah, look, it's been a rough couple of weeks. Not sure if I'm up for this. Not sure if I believe. To his face. This is not an impressive group of people. This is not an impressive group of leaders. This is definitely not a group of global apostles. Can you relate? I can totally relate. All the time. Yeah, but I don't even believe. That's okay. Hang around long enough. Listen to his words. See what happens. See what happens by the Spirit. You don't need to impress God to be used of God. You don't need to have it all together. Look at this. Jesus starts to speak and he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So this is what he establishes. This place 
right? This place no longer belongs to the devil like you think. I have now got all authority. I can do whatever I like on earth, same as in heaven. Every bit of power and authority rests with me. Not with you, with me. Authority is on the side of my mission, is on the side of my calling, is on the side of what I plan to do. And the good news is you don't have to have authority then. You don't even need to be impressive because you just need to partner with the person who does. Right? Right? All authority on, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he says, go. He doesn't say, hang around. Study the word for the next 20 years. Right? What does he say? Go. Go. This is so counter human rational because you're not even talking to people who are ready to go. You're talking to people who are saying, I don't even know if I believe in you, let alone go. He's speaking prophetically over his church that aligns with his mission. Listen to this. Go, therefore, because I have authority, go. Don't hang around, go. Pastor, I've been waiting for God to call me. Go. Today's the day. Every day after this day, you cannot say my church does not have, I don't have anything to do. I don't know what to do. I'm just here to attend. Go. Now it gets real, right? It gets real because what's the first thing you realize? I can't do this. Go to who? To the people I know. That's not a good idea. I mean, they've been seeing me popping pills, getting drunk, sleeping around. You know, I, they don't even know I really come to church that much. Go therefore and what? Make disciples of all the nations. All the nations. Can I tell you why this is the craziest statement these Jews had ever heard? Jews had never had a positive relationship with other nations in the history of their existence. For thousands of years, they were either at war or enslaved. Go and make disciples, meaning build relationship, mentor, right? Raise them. But, but you, you're sending me to all nations. These are not, this is, wait, last time we went, they tried to kill us every time or enslave us. This is not, this is not a plan, Jesus. Yes, but remember, all authority on heaven and earth is now with, with me, all right? Okay, so you're calling me to a people that I have no rapport with. This is not going to make sense. Then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Whoa, for a second. The Holy Spirit has yet to be fully come. Pentecost has yet to happen. So when he says, go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they don't actually know all of what he's talking about. Come on now. We're talking to Jewish people here. Eh? They would have had questions. All right? Like, let's process this for a moment, Jesus. Okay, firstly, I don't even know if I believe. I'm in the group that's not worshiping you right now. Okay, secondly, you're telling me to go, okay, where? To my enemies and to the people, people I've never had favor with. And you're telling me to do what I don't know how to do. This is a terrible plan. And Jesus is telling them to go and baptize them because he knew that the Holy Spirit would come after he ascends and that that power would come. And they would learn in the moment what it means to be baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. Right? So he understood that when they go, when they get there, when they get to where they, he sends them, to the people he's calling them, in the moment there will be resource for them to draw upon to do what he's calling them to do. But he doesn't give it to them before they go. The next instruction, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Now what did Jesus command them to do? Forgive was one of them. 70 times seven. What was the honest response? We have no faith for this. So he says, teach them to do what I told you to do. And the things he told them to do, they told him we cannot do. <laughs> Go to a people we don't have rapport with. 
baptize them in a way we don't understand, and then teach them the things we failed to learn. Teach them the things we rebelled in doing. God is saying to you, teach them to function the Holy Spirit, but I, haven't, I don't pray in tongues ever. Uh, teach them to be healed, but I've never ever believed anyone could get healed. Teach them about Jesus, but I don't even have faith to talk about Jesus outside of my car where I'm listening to Pastor so-and-so preach. Yeah. Now you're starting to realize it. And he doesn't go. The doubt is out the room. The doubt is out the way. Only those worshiping, full of faith. He's speaking this over them because the authority to do this doesn't rest with us. It rests with us partnering with him. <laughs> then we function in it. I saw someone posting the other day about how this church is doomed with myself and Tara at the helm. I can tell you something. I'm with you, brother. We don't have a chance in our own strength to do what God's called us to do. We, <laughs> I categorically, I've told this to Redemption Church many times. When I functioned in my own strength, I was a joke. I was that guy, drunk on a bar, with his shirt off, swinging the lights, biting the glass, putting it in the air, trying to header it. I am no one impressive to anyone in my own ability. But Jesus says, go. He says, go. And he says to you, go. Now, look at this. Teaching them to do what I've commanded you, but we've never done any of your commandments. We hate doing them. Serving people, loving people, praying for people who hate us, forgiving people, giving away our stuff. It's not nice. It's not fun. And Jesus says, in this, I'm with you always to the end of the age. In John chapter 14, verses 12, Jesus says something. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Now, there's two reasons. He goes to the Father because the work is finished and because now we are reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit to function on earth, to flow in a supernatural power, to be of use in a supernatural way. So I wanted to do something with you today that would illustrate this to you and to show you. Now, I believe there is an anointing on this pulpit. I believe it. But I have to tell you something, church. The anointing is not only on the pulpit. The anointing is in the room. It's in the house of God. It's in the place of God. And it's for the people of God to fulfill the purpose of God. It's actually, if you really want to know where Jesus would be in this place today, it's the midst, the middle. And I believe we as a church are going to walk in greater works, not because of what happens in the pulpit, but because the presence of God is with us where we go. How am I going to be relevant, pastor, to the world? Well, look at the first, the first evangelist, the first person to tell people Jesus is Messiah is the woman at the well. Now, in those days, there was no social media, no news cameras. So you only really knew what was going on in your village. And in her village, she was a woman with not one, two, three, or four but five different husbands in an age where divorce was literally intolerable. I can imagine if she had five husbands, she had a lot of other physical relationships too. I could imagine that maybe she was raised, maybe she was sexually abused, maybe there was physical trauma in her past that let her walk in such a sexual brokenness that she would give herself to every man that ever showed her any interest. And Jesus shows up for her. The Bible tells us he went through Samaria just for her. Just for her. And when he encounters her at the well, he doesn't ask her to have faith, 
show me, because she's not even fellowshipping in the temple. She's not even a part of the religious community. She is, she is the one all the women hate and all the men are aware of. <laughs> and what happens? He reveals to her that he came for her. He reveals to her that he is the Messiah for her. And that not only does he know about her past, but that's the purpose for which he came. And he says to her, the day is here when you will worship in spirit and in truth. That meaning, you will, you will worship me because by the spirit you will know my grace and my salvation and the truth of your life, which is who you are in me, will be revealed to you. And she goes back to the very people that know her, that knew her, literally, sexually. And she says, come meet the man who denied my past. No. She says, come meet the man who knew everything I've done. Right? Yet, yet, my Messiah, he lives, he saves. I ask you, who is relevant to a person that is divorced? Someone who's been divorced once. Who's relevant to someone who's been divorced twice? Someone who's been divorced twice. And overcome and succeeded. Well, let me tell you how I overcame. I mean, when you flick through social media and you see someone who lost 50 kilograms, what's your first question? And they show you before and after. Hey, what did you do? You see someone who speaks about overcoming this or dealing, that's what all we're doing right now is looking for who has answers. She was the most relevant person to that entire place because she was the most known to such a degree that she was the worst person ever. Maybe you sit in this room today and you say, I've got a real mess in my life right now, pastor. I'm not ready to be used by God. I have to tell you this. That's not scripturally accurate. Jesus shows up in the midst of your mess and he doesn't judge you because your judgment has been taken. And he says, this is why I came, right? And when you receive his ministry into your mess, when you allow him into your midst and he starts to work and change, you actually start to function in what it says in Isaiah chapter 60, where it says, arise and shine for your light has come. Darkness covers the earth, thick darkness the people, but the Lord's glory will arise over you and be seen upon you. And Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Here's the thing. People come to you when they see what God does for you, through you. And the good news I'm telling you today is there is nothing in your life bad enough that God can't turn it around for good. When scripture says he uses all things together for good, scripture does not deny that all things includes all bad things. So you might look at your life right now and say, every single thing is cooperating to destroy me. The Bible says all of those things co cooperating to destroy you will be used of God to cooperate for my good. And she went back and she had a message potentially Jesus himself couldn't preach because she was the message. She was the testimony. You work with people, live with people, know people. You're friends with people. Maybe in, in lockdown you, you got divorced. Maybe in lockdown you got addicted to substances. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you say, I'm the least qualified. That's what qualifies you for the grace of God. That's what qualifies you to be used by God. That's what makes you relevant because you're living in the same world the world is living in, facing the same problems, facing the same challenges. And so now that I've said, although the anointing is on the pulpit, the truth is the anointing is in the room under the Word of God. We're gonna do something. Redemption, you're gonna do this as well. I want everyone to stand up, please. Redemption, please stand as well. Right now, you're all looking at me. And I believe this is a prophetic picture for us as a church. Right now, you're all looking and, and you were looking at the stage. You were looking at the pulpit. And now you're looking at me or you're looking at a screen to see me. Right? But I believe this is what's been wrong with the church. I believe the season we're going into is we need to change 
our perspective. All right? Our word for the year is Redemption Church, and now it's for Rhema, was look again. Because Isaiah chapter 60, verses four says, after it declares you're gonna rise and shine, the glory is gonna be on you, kings are gonna seek you out, people are gonna seek you out. It says, lift up your eyes all around and see. And the Hebrew there in verse four is, look up, in other words, see Jesus. And then the second instruction is now look around and look again. Take a second look. Look again. And I believe that is an instruction to change our perspective. And right now, all around the world, people are saying, I'm going to go back to the pulpit. People are saying, do you know what's happened with this pastor? Do you know what's happened with this leader? I was hurt in church. I was offended in church. I was let down by church. And I get it. I get it. But could you imagine being called to the church where the very first sermon is preached by the guy who denied Jesus to your very face a few weeks earlier? Peter was the least qualified to talk about Jesus. Peter was the least qualified to be used by God. Anybody but Peter, Lord. Can we turn the lights on the stage on? Right? Anybody but Peter, God. Anybody but Peter would have been the church's response. But the very reason God uses Peter is to show them the greatest failures can be redeemed and restored to be used by the power of the Holy Spirit for the greatest moments. And this is what I want our church to do in Redemption 2. Right now, the whole church is looking at the pulpit, looking at the pulpit, looking at this place. What happens if, if, what happens if our leader fails, if our leader falls? What happens if they don't see me, they greet me, they don't know me, they didn't commission me, they didn't anoint me, they didn't ordain me? Your eyes are in the wrong place. Turn around in Redemption and in Rhema, I want you to face the doors. I want everyone to turn around and face the doors. Face the doors, the exits of the building. In Redemption Church as well, I want you to face the doors. This is where you should be looking. This is where you should be focusing. That God is calling you to do something supernatural out there. That you are called to go through those doors with the anointing of God on your life. To reach, to serve, to be used by God in the most mighty way. And even when you come into this place, what you hear from this pulpit is not about the person preaching, but about the word God wants you to hear so that you can be effective out there. What God does in here is meant to go with you out there. And the early church gathered every day, but it wasn't to have church. It was to have an encounter under the word of God so that they could go back to their workplace, back to their family, back to their village. And even though they were being persecuted and martyred and killed and chased, where they went, miracles took place. As you look at the doors, I want you to hear this from the voice of God. I have called you. I have anointed you. I have appointed you. Your life will be a testimony of my goodness and my grace. I will speak through you. I will use you. I will turn your mess, your fears, your anxieties, your addictions, your mistakes around for good. Let me lead you and guide you. By the power of my spirit, you will be a glorious, precious, powerful child of mine. And I will show you my grace is as much on you as it is on anybody else. It is your time to shine. It's go time. Amen. That's how a church is built. Not on programs, not on events, not on talent, but that everybody in this place comes and has a divine encounter with God. And every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, is going, Lord, lead me, use me. Lord, thank you, you love me. Lord, thank you, I'm called. And God starts to give you words. Do you know, there are people in your life that a sermon would never save, but when the Holy Spirit says to you, just tell them these three words, just tell them that, just share this. In that moment, they go, God is real because you've just spoken into my life something supernatural. That's who your God is. 
And that's what He's going to do. I believe with all my heart, God has just gotten started. Just gotten started. And I believe in the future, (laughs) it's irrespective of what the name of the church is, who's the senior pastor. What's most important is that Jesus Christ is glorified and that the Holy Spirit uses you, moves in your life and works through you. You won't need me to lay hands. You won't need someone to preach. You won't need to wait for Sunday. You will be in the moment going, God wants me to pray for you right now. You'll be in the moment going, I have something to share with you right now. And and, and by Sunday, you'll just be bringing people that have already encountered God already going, oh, is this the place where you gather? Okay, fantastic. But that's what's needed. That Jesus is glorified. That's the church God's gonna build. That's what we are believing for and that's what we're shooting for. And that's the mission that we're on. Amen. 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 What an amazing word. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Uh, I want to I wanna give people in the room an opportunity uh, that have maybe hit rock bottom or that have felt that what they have built is not working. I love how David writes in the Psalms, he says, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. And I want to extend an invitation where Jesus says, I want to build your life. I want to build. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't send his son to condemn you. His heart is to save. His heart is to build. So if that's you, if you can feel the Lord touching your heart today, we are going to give you an opportunity right here, right now, to say the prayer of salvation. As a family, we'll all pray together. So let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I accept that invitation. I want you to build my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Help me, Jesus. I need you in my life. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you died for me, that my sins are forgiven. And that I'm a righteous child. Today, I receive your finished work. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give those people a hand that prayed that today. Awesome. Absolutely amazing. Um, If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, uh, we really want to celebrate with you. And church... uh, We have an opportunity to receive communion now. So if you don't have communion, please put your hand up. Our hosts will will get that communion to you. One or two people on the left here. Uh, You are welcome to stand. You are welcome to sit. As long as your eyes are on Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful message this morning. That our eyes are not on our ability. Our eyes are not on all the questions that we have, we simply say, yes, Lord, because of what you've done. Communion is just such an amazing reminder of everything that's been done for us. Why we get to go is because of the cross. So let's receive that today. Lord, I just thank you as we receive this bread as we receive this broken body, we receive wholeness in our lives. For those areas where we feel like we fall short, where we are still very broken, where we don't hit the mark, we thank you, Lord, because of your body, we receive wholeness. We receive shalom. Nothing missing and nothing broken. For our lives, for our families, Let's receive that now, in Jesus' name. Lord.
Lord, and we thank you for this blood. This blood that speaks a better word over our lives. Despite what our circumstances might be shouting, your blood declares that we are righteous. That we are saved. We are fully saved. And we have a purpose. Lord, we thank you that your blood continually washes us. White as snow. We are your redeemed children. Righteous. Forgiven. Precious. And we are able ministers of the good news because of your blood. Thank you, Jesus. Let's receive.